episode seven of Crash Testiva. I'm your host, Christy Eikers. Now we are in the midst of holiday entertaining and I can imagine many of you are gonna be attending gatherings or even hosting some parties in the next few days. Today, we've got some great hosting tips and some easy appetizers and cocktail ideas for you all. Without further ado, let's get started. Also, 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 also. We begin with our segment we lovingly call also. In honor of my niece, Josie, who may or may not overuse the word also. If you want to hear the story behind this, you can listen to episode four. Anyway, it's a chance for us to share feedback we received from you and maybe offer some clarification for anything from past episodes. On Facebook, I received a message from Missy Hobbs Bassett. She was replying to the post on the pumice stone. She wrote, I use it all the time, but don't overuse it because it can actually scratch porcelain, but it's great for toilets. Hey, that's good to know. It can help on those mineral deposits in the toilets. I haven't tried it there yet. Thanks, Missy. Now, Carrie Romero wrote to me in Facebook Messenger. She wrote to tell me that she loves the tips and tricks part, especially she took that advice about the super glue at the dollar store. Sidebar, I've been doing a lot of holiday entertaining and my nails are just a mess. And I again got one of those terrible hooks on my thumbnail. So I am right now rocking a nice super glue glaze on that thumb. Just, just FYI. Carrie also wrote and said she was listening to episode six and she relived her days at Pleasure Island. She said, oh, so many memories. And Carrie, I couldn't agree with you more. I have a lot of fond memories of Pleasure Island. Thank you all for taking time to let us know your thoughts about our podcast. Please, please, please keep the feedback coming. It really does keep us going. Now on to the show. We're going to start this episode with our taking it for a test drive segment. On Thanksgiving Day, I received a text from my Uncle Pat. Remember, he's not my real uncle. He was like my dad's best friend, and I adore him. He said this, You're going to hear from one of Julianne's very best friends, Jewel Clark. She was at our house for Thanksgiving, and she just served an hors d'oeuvre that has Minnesota roots, and I think you'll enjoy her story. Maybe a good fit for your podcast. She would be a good interview. She's a great cook and a talker and an authentic avocado head. So, Jewel, with that introduction from my Uncle Pat, welcome. Oh, that definitely sounds like Pat. That's awesome. (laughs) So here's my question. What is an authentic avocado head? Well, the funny thing is, I think it's because I'm always bringing them avocados. I have avocado trees, but my husband and I don't like avocados, so we bring them to them so it's really funny that he says I'm an avocado head because I I am the one who's like oh no I have two giant avocado trees and I don't want any of them oh my gosh I've never met a person with an avocado tree how many avocados does a tree produce oh uh I don't know maybe like 50 or 100 or they're pretty big trees so does it go all year round or well, is there a season don't, they don't ripen on the tree and so once you pick okay. them they'll ripen in one to two weeks so it's kind of nice because I could go out there right now I could pick a couple of avocados and then in a week and a half someone else might enjoy them so there's kind of always just some on there and it's funny because people come to visit us and all of a sudden they're like out in the yard picking avocados like great have them I'm not you know, I'm not worried at all enjoy so okay I am super jealous because we have to go to the grocery store and pay money for our avocados. Yeah. So, wow. Well, that would be amazing. And San Diego is actually a huge area for avocados. So, um, you know, a lot of the avocados you get, maybe they are even coming this far. I don't know where on the East Coast they grow avocados or, you know, anywhere else. So, wow. Yeah. Well, Jewel. Okay. Well, normally, I, I, this is a very new thing for me to have a guest on that. I've never met. This oh. is the first time Jewel and I are meeting, so you're kind of a big deal, Jewel. Well, that thanks. you know, this I is feel my first. Super special. This is my first podcast that I've ever been well, on. So. There you go. It's a first for both Sounds of us. Good. That's outstanding. Yes. Okay. So now I want to hear. It, normally, when I have a guest on, I ask him to tell us three things that we don't know about okay. them, and so I feel like we just learned something yes. that you have two avocado trees yeah. in your backyard. One okay, that's a big deal too. Day. They're technically in my front yard, right next to the driveway. Oh. So 
<laughs> okay, can you explain the difference between the two avocados? Um, one's bumpier than the other one. Uh, I believe that the Fuerte is the preferred avocado of my friends, but um yeah they're just different varieties avocados have to be near another avocado tree to cross pollinate or something scientific like that so um oh i don't know if that's gosh. why the original owners planted two right there but um most of my friends are pretty happy about it well i was gonna say our listeners are getting like a little education a horticulture yes. le- a lesson today two other things you want to share with us let's see um well i guess my day job is uh as in education so i taught medical chemistry in high schools and started a career pathway at the high school i was at and now i support career pathways throughout the san diego county so uh, my day job is very sciencey. It will start a very sciencey and has kind of melded into some regional work. Um, and then let's see the third interesting factoid. Um, I grew up about 30 minutes from Yosemite. So I am a small town mountain girl, uh, turned into big city, San Diego. Wow. Well, I have to say two things. First of all, regarding education, yes. I think nurses and teachers are just doing God's work. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> I also have to say San Diego, if I had to choose a place I would like to live, it would have to be San Diego. Well, it seems like you're going to have to come out to visit. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, you know, the premise behind the show is we tell a lot of stories, we give some tips. And so I feel like this episode, we're kind of devoting to some last minute holiday Ooh. tips and ideas and appetizers. And and you have this hors d'oeuvre recipe that Pat raved about. All right. And this and it has a story behind it. So you are a natural guest on the Crash Test Diva podcast. So I'm just going to turn it over to you so you can tell us all about it. All right. So this is uh, interesting in a way. And I like the last minute nature of it um, because I tend to be someone who plans and plans and plans and plans and plans um, around a party. And so when it came around to my birthday last year, I said, I just, I want to figure out a way not to have to do as much planning. And so what I did is I said, we're having a mystery box challenge and everyone has to bring mystery ingredients. So as people arrived, they put things into like an ice chest and a basket in the living room and I'd go into the other room so that once everyone was there, I opened it up and had to make dinner out of whatever everyone brought, which it's funny because Julian, who's Pat's daughter, that she literally was talking about how this is her actual nightmare. And yet for I, me, I couldn't it agree was like, more. yes, this sounds like a great <laughs> challenge. I can't wait to give myself this for my birthday. So, um, okay. Let's just say, Jewel, you must be a pretty avid cook. Yes, you, you're a foodie. Absolutely, you're a foodie. Absolutely. I am. I love to cook. It's like something that even calms me down. Like if it's, if I'm just reeling and if I could just go sit in the kitchen for a while, it, it actually is like relaxing and like enjoyable. So yeah. Okay. I can't wait to hear the rest of the story because I'm with Julian. This would be my ner- worst nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So I open it up and, and here's the thing I preface. I said, this is not chopped. I don't want a f- basket full of garbage you know I and the threat that I made was that anything you bring you have to be willing to help prepare so that we didn't get you know squeamish person bringing you know some cow brains or something like that although I have had cow brains before (laughs) um in Macedonia but that's a whole nother story luckily no one brought cow brains to my um mystery basket challenge uh but I open it up There were a number of ingredients, most of which were common, you know, like chicken and steaks and um, asparagus. And then my one friend who does always like to throw the curveball, of course, brought stuffing mix and spam. Now, I had not ever cooked with spam before. Um, And so, you know, just kind of uh, grab a few things and I'm looking at it. and Oh, and someone else brought endive. You know, the little, they're like little lettuces that look like a torpedo almost. Yes. Um, And someone else brought some broccoli. So I kind of start categorizing all the stuff into what they go with. And that's maybe ended up being the leftover bit. So like I go into the kitchen, everyone's kind of talking and laughing. And I just start, I chop up the spam into tiny little dice, um, saute it up in some butter. And then I kind of rehydrate the stuffing mix. Stuffing mix is not something that I have ever made before because my um, family stuffing recipe is one of those ones where once I've made it for someone, then their family adopts said recipe. So, you know, this I'm this is foreign to me. 
Um, so I, <laughs> I saute up. I make them really small, tiny, like centimeter dice of the spam. And then saute that up. Cut the broccoli so the florets are, are very, very small. Um, cook that in with the spam. Add some rehydrated stuffing mix. Did, and you did you rehydrate with like a little chicken stock oh, or water or what did you use? I just did hot water. I don't, you know, okay, this, was, okay. this was a la minute. Okay, so this is like <laughs> super quick. We're, we're getting this done. And then um, pull out the little endives, make the little scoops out you pull it apart and each each one is like a little boat or a scoop um just fill it all in and so then I walk out with this tray uh and everyone looks at me and wait I, what what do you mean you just made <laughs> you just made that already like we didn't even pay attention that you were making things over there and you know I think there were eight or ten people and and it was an immediate hit I mean people were having more than one people who were like really afraid of spam you know, were like <laughs> quietly coming up to, to get a second, a second piece. And, you know, I'm refilling to make more and then, you know, starting on, on the next thing. So, um, so this, this, so this recipe has become kind of in our friend group, kind of a historical moment of like wild and crazy gone right. Right. Okay. So is it, there a special stuffing mix? Like, is there a flavor to the stuffing mix? Uh, the what stuffing kind. mix? Chicken okay, flavored so stuffing just mix. Just any grocery store yep, chicken the flavored. Cheap kind okay. that comes off the shelf that like kind of just looks like someone put a bunch of <laughs> sand in a blender. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how to explain them. Um, okay. Yeah. So well, and and for the listeners who don't know the connection to a spam in Minnesota, is yes. that. It is produced in Austin, Minnesota. Did you know that we have a spam museum here? I have since found out in some uh, ongoing research into this. Um, so what <laughs> happened too, and the reason I found that out is actually through Pat. So um, this year, so so my birthday was actually back in March, and so you move on and everything. We get to Thanksgiving, and I'm like, what 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 should I make for an appetizer at Thanksgiving, right? And I was like, ta-da! Obviously, the spam and stuffing boats right and dive well, boats absolutely I mean, what else yeah, would go stuffing. so perfectly thanksgiving because it's so, so i made it for my family and then i came and uh i went we had like a friend's thanksgiving i ended up at gary and julian's with pat on actual thanksgiving day and and made the appetizer there and that's when pat was just blown away <laughs> That I would really reach into his own Minnesota roots to bring him something really special for Thanksgiving Day. Uh, because it turns out that Spam started in Minnesota and continues to be uh, headquartered in Minnesota, although apparently there are many factories worldwide, as this is, I think that said something like 7 billion cans of Spam have been sold in the in the world. Uh, but yeah, so back in Minnesota in the 30s. Uh, that's where Spam came from and became a huge uh, part of the World War II uh, food o- items for for the military, and that's how the it military, got it started. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you do you plate these all, and they need to be eaten really quickly, or is is it more of like a people dip the endive, or how do you do it? I plate it, so I put I okay. I set out the endives, and then I just scoop a spoonful of the Spam stuffing. Um, broccoli mixture into each one and then you can just eat it. It's kind of like a two bite, you know, one of those awkward appetizers that's like you could shove it all in there, but maybe you'll take two (laughs) bites. You have to, depends on the size of the lettuce. Um, And so... Uh, yeah, it's just, so I'll just put out I'm a plate. All, I'm all for, I'm all for awkward appetizers. So keep going. Perfect. And then, um, and so, but then you can kind of leave the rest of it in the pan and then plate up another round when you need it. Not if, because people will love it. Um, it does run very salty. <laughs> I can imagine. Because stuffing mix and spam happen to both be very salty items. So whatever you do, do not add any salt. Um, good tip. Good. And tip. you don't need like the whole box of stuffing mix by any means. It's kind of, um, you know, like a handful that I, I throw in there. I think I have that in my, in my recipe, something okay. like a quarter of a box of stuffing mix. <laughs> okay. And you posted this recipe because you have a food blog. I is do, that right? I do. I, although it's rarely updated, foodiecurious.com is my food blog. So it's posted there and, uh, you're welcome to also right. post it on your site. 
We will link to it okay. in our show notes. Awesome. So as people listen, they can just like click on it and see the recipe. And um, maybe we can find a picture to post alongside oh, yeah. from either either one of those great gatherings uh, uh, where you celebrated with the, what do we call it? The Spam, spam stuffing. And stuffing and Dive Boats, I believe. I think that's it's the so title fancy. from my it's um, just so, blog, so we'll go with that. So, so very fancy, just like you, my friend. Yes. And I can't tell you, I can't wait to meet you in person someday soon. Right. But I do think we're going to have to have you back on another episode, okay? It. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm switching things up this week for the Long Distance Serenade. Instead of a request from one of you, well, this is my own personal request. Shortly after David Cassidy died, my college roommate, Vanessa Hoke, texted me and said, I think you should do a Partridge Family Christmas album tribute. She was so right. I must pay homage to my favorite Christmas album. Now, when I was growing up, my sister had a huge crush on David Cassidy, and one year she asked for the Partridge Family Christmas album. I listened to it all the time, and during college... I recorded this album on one side of a cassette, and I also recorded volume one of the A Very Special Christmas album. This was the album with the red cover. Again, volume one. I I recorded that on the other side. This was way before the days of radio stations transitioning to holiday music for the weeks leading up to Christmas. So as I left Mankato after Thanksgiving break, I started this tape up, and I didn't stop playing it until after Christmas. During my junior year at St. Kate's, I was in a video production class. This is back when we recorded on actual tape with huge cameras and tripods. And you couldn't just edit it on a computer. We had to reserve time and edit in these recording suites. Thankfully, I had a work-study job in the AV department. So I would get after-hours access to the equipment and the editing bay. I remember my bosses even allowing me to stay in the library after hours. That's where the editing bay was. So I could edit overnight to finish my projects on time. I would actually have to call security to let me out in the morning. For my final project that semester, I decided I would do a video Christmas card. Now, I've posted this on YouTube for your viewing pleasure. We've got a link in the show notes. Remember, it was a class project before recording and editing or digital. So please, no judgment. One of the vignettes I shot was during finals week with my two roommates, Jen and Van. Unfortunately, this was also before I started checking the weather forecast. And the day we had our outdoor shoot, it was about 20 degrees below zero. The song I used at the beginning of the video and the end, well, it is my favorite song off the Partridge Family Christmas card album. I know every word to this song. I'm pretty certain most of you have never heard of the song. It's not on any holiday classics list. However, when I mentioned this to our Renaissance Rebel, he was familiar with the album as he had it growing up too. The name of the song is My Christmas Card to You. I'm dedicating this song to my two college roommates, Vanessa Hoke and Jen Fernandez. This one goes out for you for enduring the outdoor video shoot, and for enduring the endless playing of the Partridge Family Christmas album. Christmas.
Christmas time and all the whole year through. It's time for the tip of the day. Holidays are stressful, especially when you are hosting gatherings. My sister Annie is one of the greatest hostesses. Her tablescapes, well, they rival Martha Stewart's. And each year, she and her husband Paul host us on Christmas Day. I've invited her to help us out with this segment and share some quick and easy holiday entertaining tips. Hi, Annie. Hey, Christy. How you doing? Good. Now, we only have a few days before Christmas, so let's jump right in with one of your fabulous tips. All right, I'm going to start with your table linens. If you are like I used to be and you like to use the 100% cotton or linen tablecloths, you know they're awful to iron. But I learned that you can launder them and take them to your dry cleaners and they will press them for you. And when they come back to you, they are hanging beautifully pressed on a roll and you just have to put them on your table. So that also goes for your napkins. If you are still using cotton napkins, they will press them for you too. I say just throw all of them out and start buying some polyester tablecloths. Well, <laughs> that's part two. Okay. So I did do that. And I, I now use poly blended tablecloths so that there's very little upkeep involved. And instead of the cotton napkins, I use bar towels or kitchen towels as my napkins. So again, very easy. Wash them, fold them up, put them away till next time. And they're not expensive. I usually buy mine at Target or Kohl's. Let's talk about, I've got, I've got one tip for hostessing, but I, I learned it from you. And that is when you set your table, like let's say you're setting a table for a party and a buffet that people are going to walk through. You get all your serving pieces out there so you know what you have and you take your menu and you put every little item on a post-it note and you put it on that serving piece. And so number one, you make sure that you have a serving plate ready for each item. And then also if you have somebody helping you, they know where that thing goes. The other thing that helps you realize is if you have the serving bowl, then what are you going to use to scoop it out? And do you have enough of those? So it's sort of a two part. My next tip is related to the bar. Okay, let's go. I like to do a cocktail that I can premix. So if you're making Cosmos, you make a pitcher of them. Then as you serve them, you just shake up what you need, pour it into the glass, and you're good to go. So you're not measuring out each individual drink. People have to remember that they make it in a pitcher without ice. And then they fill the yep. shaker with the ice. And each time they make the drink, they pour it into the shaker with the ice. Exactly. They don't want it to water down. Exactly. And also remember that Oprah says the first drink at a party should be a stiff one. You want your guests getting loosened up, ready for the party. My cocktail tip is an easy cocktail. And it's to do like a champagne or a Prosecco cocktail where you just add a liqueur and top it off with Prosecco. And I got this uh, idea when I was on a cruise ship. One of the gals I was with, mm -hmm. Patty Navarro, she ordered this and it's a St. Germain with Prosecco cocktail. And again, I'll link to it in the show notes, but it's super easy and super yummy and people kind of think you're fancy. So. And champagne cocktails are always good. True. Everybody True. And them. I mean, at our last party the other night, we ran out of the elderflower St. Germain um, liqueur. And so we put a little pomegranate juice and then topped it with Prosecco or I had some cranberry juice and we topped it with Prosecco. So. It's all Very good. versatile. Very versatile. Okay, let's talk easy, easy appetizers. This is an oldie but a goodie, and I make it for everything. I'm tired of it, but I still get requests, so I still make it. It's artichoke dip. Now, there's a real recipe for it, but here's how I make it. I take my can of artichokes and I drain them. Put them in my food processor. I take my bag of shredded mozzarella, dump it in. My bag of shredded Parmesan, dump it in. My can of chopped green chilies dump it in, and then a large scoop of mayo, about a cup, dump it in, chop it up, put it in a greased baking. I use a shallow dish like a quiche dish, and you can bake it at 350 until it's golden brown, which is usually about 20 to 30 minutes. If you make it ahead, 
you can put it, you know, you can just put it in the dish and cover it and then bake it, or you can put it in a Tupperware and bring it out a day or two later and get it ready to go. Yeah, and it is delicious. And I, for one, I mean, any cracker is good, but I'm a fan of the wheat thins with that. Okay, so I like the Triscuit, but apparently the wheat thin is more popular, is what my husband has explained to me. Well, I couldn't agree with him more. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Now, my appetizer is, believe it or not, even easier than your appetizer. <laughs> it is a bacon wrap date, and I've been taking the fancy um, dates. What are they called? Majul? How do you say that? Do you know? Yeah, I think that's how you say it. Majul. Majul. Yeah. And I actually cut it into thirds and I pull out the pit and then I take a few slices of bacon and I cut that into thirds. I wrap the piece of the date with the bacon and stab it with a toothpick. And now here's the deal. You can buy um, any kind of dates. You can buy pitted dates, you know, just adjust it accordingly. But I like, a, a, I like my bacon to really wrap that date and you throw it. I use a cast iron pan because I think that's even easier. I put them in a cast iron pan. I put a few in there. I do it at about 400, 425. I do it for 15 minutes, and I turn it like once at about seven minutes. That that date just turns into like jelly. I love that appetizer. It's my favorite. It is delicious, and I like it when you let the bacon get a little crispy. Absolutely, and that that happens in that uh, that happens in the cast iron uh, skillet. And I will tell you, the cleanup could not be easier. So that is my super, super easy. Some people make it fancy and they add a little cheese in there or they add like an almond in there. I'm telling you, it's just fine. Just the date and the bacon. Oh, I think the most important thing when you're entertaining is just to try to have fun at your party <laughs> and not get so stressed out about it, which is really a hard thing to do. But just remember, it's generally your family, you know. Yeah. How bent out of shape can they get? Right. I, they, I mean, seriously, if they, if they can't handle it, then they can host it is my motto. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I'm in with that. Okay, well, I will be over to your house on Christmas Day with bells on, and um, I'll be bringing my dates and uh, whatever else I've signed up for at this point, okay? And I'll have a really stiff cocktail waiting for oh, you. I can hardly wait. Okay, Annie, Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you, you too. Christmas is filled with fun and fond memories. This one, well, it gets repeated annually. Without further ado, let me tell you a story. Growing up, Mom and Dad started a Christmas Eve tradition. Late in the afternoon, we would load up the kitchen table with appetizers, and we would have two crockpots going, one with beer cheese soup and the other one with hot beefs. You should know Dad slaved over the beer cheese soup for hours. The key to making it is slow and low. I realized this when I took over soup baking duty after he died. His recipe takes hours, but I still recall him pulling up a stool to the stove, sipping on a beer all the while he was stirring the soup. The soup was definitely made with love. When I make the soup now, I try to channel him. While I don't like beer, I'll pour myself a glass of wine while I tend to the pot. I'm going to post the recipe for the beer cheese soup and the hot beefs in the show notes, just in case you guys want to give it a try. We would all bring some appetizers and we'd sample and snack for hours. The Calvins would stop over for a visit. They were our neighbors, Ray, Eric, and Jennifer. And so would Furley and his folks. More people could have stopped, but I, I can't quite recall. I have to be honest. One of my favorite meals is an appetizer buffet. I mean, really, what could be more fun than feasting on finger food? Anyway, I, I digress. When my first niece, Kayla, was old enough to understand all the fanfare of the fat jolly guy who visits from the North Pole, the holidays got even more exciting and special for all of us. We kept with this tradition and we'd let her open a few presents early. And I recall when she was three or four, I volunteered to go to bed early that night with her to read her the night before Christmas. We squeezed into my twin bed and I began to read. Now, as you can imagine, I was extremely animated. 
When the story ended, I told her we needed to be very quiet and we had to fall asleep or Santa would not come. We cuddled up and we tried really hard to fall asleep. But you know, you know how exciting it is. It's just, it's so hard to fall asleep. There was finally a moment of silence. And then, okay, I'm not too proud to tell this part of the story. I mean, I'm human. It's natural, it happens. Especially after an afternoon of cocktails, appetizers, hot beefs, and beer cheese soup. I passed a little gas. Kayla said, Auntie Pooh, did you hear that? I think Santa just landed on the roof. I can't tell you how hard I tried not to laugh as I said, I think you're right. Santa just landed. Now try really hard to go to sleep. That's it for our show. I hope you enjoyed this episode and escaped a little stress that happens each holiday season. If you laughed, even a little, or learned a little something, hit the share button from your podcast app to send a friend a little fun for the holidays. Jewel Clark, thanks so much for joining us and for sharing your gourmet spam hors d'oeuvre story. Gourmet and spam. I don't know if it's ever been used together. Anyway, thanks Uncle Pat for the great contribution to the show. We'll post a link to Jewel's blog and recipe in the show notes. I hope you will all click the YouTube video I posted, the college project that inspired this week's long distance serenade. It will give you a little insight into my college experience and introduce you to many family members. Thank you so much, Vanessa Hoke, for giving me this fabulous idea. And thanks to our Renaissance Rebel. JC, I know you are still recovering from the crud and I so appreciate you bringing one of my favorite holiday tunes to life. And to my sister Annie for her fabulous hosting tips. I'm looking forward to having some fun at your house this Christmas. Please join us for episode eight. I'm hoping to release it before New Year's as I'm going to have Liza Atkinson back. She's going to join us to share a new take on New Year's resolutions. As I mentioned in the beginning, we love to hear from you. Please send us a message on social media or on our website. We will link all of our outlets in the show notes. We also welcome your show ideas, you know, like Vanessa and Uncle Pat. Thanks again for listening. I hope you've been able to escape a little of your own reality. And I hope you've enjoyed this show. After the holidays, when you have a bit of downtime, feel free to leave us a review on iTunes. A big thanks to Josie Eichers for getting the word out through all our social media channels and for updating our website. Remember, bruises are like life. The harder you get hit, the more colorful and interesting they get. Yeah.